Welcome to this joint webinar hosted by the Partners of the Impact Management Platform. This is to mark the launch of the platform, which took place last week. I'm Clara Barbie, I'm Chief Executive of the Impact Management Project, which was a time-bound initiative running until this month. It's made the case for why coordination among sustainability initiatives, and even convergence in some cases, is so key to mainstreaming impact management. To give you a couple of examples of what this has led to to date, there's now, for the first time, a web tool that explains how different resources can be used by companies and investors together to manage sustainability impacts. And it's authored collectively by the providers of those different resources. We know that can complete consolidation is important in terms of content wherever possible and appropriate. But we also know that as with financial accounting versus credit ratings versus codes of conduct, some resources shouldn't consolidate because they actually have different and complementary functions, but they do need to be coherent. And the website has launched this week and is accessible for everyone via the new website for the impact management platform. It's looking for your feedback, so please give it. This is just the beginning. It will be updated over time, but think of it as an authoritative go-to for practitioners of all kinds, whether you're just starting out or you're looking to improve your practice. Another important example of progress to date is the new International Sustainability Standards Board. Earlier this month, the IFRS Foundation announced the creation of this new board. It wouldn't have happened without the coordination of all of the disclosure-focused initiatives who work together with the support of the Impact Management Project and who will now continue to coordinate through the platform. The announcement of the merger between SASB and the IARC into the Value Reporting Foundation, and subsequently the commitment of the Value Reporting Foundation and the CDSB to consolidate into the IFRS Foundation and its new board has shown why convergence among, emission, among initiatives with a shared vision is so key to mainstreaming. And these are just two examples. There are other forms of coordination that began through the Impact Management Project and will continue with urgency. For example, in the areas of digitization, as well as valuation. The Impact Management Platform is going to take that co coordination forwards. Its partners comprise those that were part of the initial impact management project with some more additions as well. And I'm joined here today by several of the organizations who are partnering through the platform. In the next 90 minutes, we're going to explore what the platform means for organizations and investors of all kinds who want to improve their sustainability impacts. We'll start with the keynote dialogues from the Secretary General of the OECD and the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, who's also the Executive Director of the UN's Environment Programme. We'll then move to a short panel that will bring together different perspectives on why convergence is so important and also what more there is to do. And our concluding panel will unite the platform's steering committee of multilaterals who will talk about the platform's work plan and what they hope to achieve together. So to kick off, we're going to have a keynote dialogue with one of the organizations that is co-chairing this initiative. Matthias Corman, Secretary General of the OECD, it's a privilege to have you with us today. You recently returned from COP26 in Glasgow. Inga Anderson, who we're going to speak with in a moment, also participated. And you've been in the G20 and G7 meetings this year. Why is management of sustainability-related risks and opportunities so important for the public and private sector? Um, thank you very much. Well, I mean, the world needs ambitious and effective action on climate change, you know, in particular, but ambitious climate action to be truly effective needs to be globally more coherent and better coordinated. There needs to be better alignment across the broad spectrum of public policy, but there also needs to be, in particular, a much improved alignment between uh, the public and private sectors when it comes to climate change, but also uh, environmental policy issues more broadly. Uh, the public sector will not be able to get uh, to global net zero by 2050 on its own. Uh, the private sector and importantly, private investment uh, will necessarily have a major role to play. Uh, there needs to be a thorough transformation of the financial system in order to help facilitate that, to better incorporate the long-term risks and opportunities. And OECD work in this space, focusing on ESG investing, is, is providing some clear recommendations here to help address these challenges. And I thought I'd just highlight a few. Um, we believe that we must strengthen the interoperability and the comparability of uh, ESG rating and investing approaches and scores, but to provide a, a strong and more objective basis from which 
uh, to inform private investment decisions. Uh, we believe we must improve the alignment of the uh, ESG environmental pillar writings with low carbon transitions uh, so that investors can be confident that ESG scores actually provide reliable insights with respect to net zero pathways, which at the moment they don't necessarily do, might surprise people. Um, we must ensure that climate transition plans become the norm uh, and that you know we have um, decision relevant information on transition risks and opportunities, including uh, science-based targets and interim reporting, uh, taking you know, very much uh, the Paris Agreement commitments into account and, and really to ensure that we can have a, a just transition that is consistent with human rights uh, principles. Uh, and the good news is that you know, regulators are increasingly focused on this. They're increasingly concerned with the stability of global capital markets uh, in this context and, and are very much stepping up uh, to, to incorporate sustainability considerations. And we're, and we're here today to launch a next phase of collaboration on sustainability impacts between the world standard setters through the impact management platform. Why is this critical right now, this collaboration? Well, we need robust uh, global standards. Uh, the uh, recent announcement of the creation of the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundations, International Sustainability Standards Board, mouthful, uh, is a big, big step forward. Uh, the formation of the uh, ISSB uh, does mark the beginning of a de facto consolidation of norms for sustainability disclosures with uh, well-known market standards such as the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, the International Integrated Reporting Council and the Climate Disclosure Standards Board being absorbed into uh, this uh, new body. Uh, alignment and implementation of uh, the business conduct standards that underlie both disclosures and impact management uh, we believe are key. Uh, so the OECD is currently in the process of updating uh, key standards on corporate conduct, including uh, corporate governance, anti-corruption and responsible uh, business conduct. And in our guidelines for multinational enterprises, we have clearly set out our expectation that investors and companies address their potential adverse impacts on people, planet and society, uh, irrespective of whether these impacts are financially material uh, to the company or not. Um, we're also developing new tools and frameworks which uh, measure business impacts on well-being uh, in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the uh, new platform will have a powerful role to leverage uh, these alongside the tools of partners as uh, the market continues uh, to evolve. And Matthias, in the context of, of standard setters coming together, the multilaterals particularly have come together as a steering committee for this platform. Why are the multilaterals so important when it comes to mainstreaming this practice in your view? Well, multilateral organizations bring countries from around the world together in different combinations and, and they provide a, a, a platform for cooperation and to find solutions to the evolving challenges of our time. And in, in our highly interconnected world with some pretty serious common and shared challenges in front of us, uh, global cooperation uh, with a view to solve those common problems and challenges is more uh, important than ever. Uh, you know, and self-evidently, uh, multilateral organizations ha have a, a clear and important role to play here, in particular, uh, when it comes to setting appropriate uh, international standards and to provide evidence-based policy guidance uh, to governments. And I mean, in, in this context, and you know, this is also, I guess, part of the conversation today, um, GDP remains, of course, an important objective measure of economic performance. However, beyond GDP, it is important to focus on those indicators that help us better consider uh, people's well-being as an essential aspect of measuring progress. So uh, as businesses are increasingly interested in considering the interests of their stakeholders, the measurement guidelines that you know, we have developed here at the OECD for well-being, we believe can be adapted for and shared with businesses. Uh, we've also developed standards on measuring impact in the area of development finance and for social entrepreneurs and the social economy. Uh, through engagement processes with member governments, multilateral organizations are also able to bring countries around the table to make 
international commitments on critical social, environmental, and economic issues. Um, I mean, an example that we've been very much involved in recently is the agreement to make our international tax system fairer and work better in, in a digitalized, globalized world economy. I mean, I think it's a real demonstration of um, multilateralism at its best. Um, lastly, we must not forget that the key challenges related to sustainable development must be addressed also through a multi-stakeholder uh, process. And you know, here at the OECD, uh, we, we have the advantage of um, having involvement, structured, structured involvement with business organizations, trade unions and civil society organizations who are all uh, closely involved in helping us shape uh, better policies for better lives. Matthias, thank you for the OECD's leadership and, and for being with us today. My pleasure. Let's now move to our second keynote dialogue with Inga Anderson. Inga Anderson, as the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, thank you very much for your time today. Inga, why is mainstreaming impact management, which is the practice of understanding and improving, as well as disclosing impacts on sustainability, across both business and finance. Why is it so critical for achieving the SDGs? Well, I'm really glad you asked this question because truly we, we can't achieve the SDGs just with the public sector alone. The public sector needs to do its shift and its lift, but we need private sector, we need finance to play a, a critical role. We understand today that to reach the SDGs, and surely we want to do that, we need about five to seven trillion dollars invested. And that investment is not available, obviously, on the public purse. So the financing gap is around two and a half trillion dollars for, for developing uh, economies, emerging markets and, and developing economies. And I'm speaking to you from our headquarters in Africa, in Nairobi, it's 1.3 trillion specifically for Africa. So how are we going to make that if we don't mobilize and figure out a way that we can really mainstream impact investment? We won't. And so for climate change, for nature, for pollution, for each of these things, we, we need to invest. And we have invested some in mitigation where the markets are beginning to pick up on renewable. And that is great. And we absolutely celebrate that. But on the adaptation side, we still have a significant gap and that's something that we really need to work on so that's a that's a priority and that mean that really means that we need resilient economies and companies that can provide profitable solutions to the problems that we have um, so that we can meet the sdgs and i speak on environmental issues without causing harm to our planet and its longer term sustainability. So these are the issues at the UN. We have launched the UN principles for responsible banking, the CEO principles for, for, for the SDGs. Uh, and each of these are kind of mobilizing trillions of dollars in assets to shift towards sustainability, but much, much more is needed. And this platform offers an amazing opportunity to, to congregate and to exchange around what really works. Great, well, I wanna pick up on the, the congregation point because what we are launching here today is a, a collaboration. It's a coming together of the world's standard setters around sustainability. And, and the platform provides the, the, the grounding for that collaboration and an opportunity to communicate it to the market so the market can keep pace with where we're seeing standards converge and mainstream. Why is collaboration so important in your view? Well, the market can't deal with a thousand different standards and a hundred different ways of doing it. And there's a lot of innovation in this space, which we very much celebrate. Um, but if you can establish a platform for business and and finance to sort of review and and so that they can manage their impacts widely and consistently, um through that coherent approach to standards through tools that will be made available to support participants then we're really beginning to make some headway because there are lots of businesses that are seeking to do this now there are also others that are in the business of greenwashing and we need to sort the wheat from the chaff here 
But as this platform comes up and as it offers up solutions, this could be really critical. In the UN, we've of course got the UNEP Financial Initiative that, that creates part of a platform for banking, for insurance, for asset owners and investors, but we need so much more. And it's, it's really good to have a, a place and a sort of um, both where the multilateral system is, 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 is engaging, but also, of course, where the private sector can, can look and where be, we can begin to ensure that there is a degree of streamlining amongst the various um, standards that are offered up by private sector, by the NGO sector, by the science sector, and indeed by the multilaterals. And as you're saying, a distinctive feature of the platform is that the multilaterals have stepped up to provide the steering committee. That's really important. What is the role of the UN in this agenda? Well, you know, we think that that clearly disclosure matters and matters greatly. And so the more we um, have standards and the more we show what we're doing, that brings a degree of credibility and, and adherence to the standards because we do always want to wash, uh, watch out for, for greenwashing. And I guess the UN really is a de facto um, custodian of the SDGs. Now, we are all custodian, don't get me wrong, but they were sort of made at the UN and all agencies within the UN system are truly mobilized to, to work with and to support countries um, reach the SDGs by 2030. This is what we agreed back in 2015. And at UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, the organization I have the privilege to head, we speak about this triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate change, the crisis of nature and biodiversity loss, and the crisis of pollution. And we need to have an understanding of why is this crisis here? Well, it's a way we consume and produce, but we all need to consume and produce. So how can we make that consumption and production uh, shifted into a different gear whereby it will be more sustainable? And that's the sort of thing that the UN brings to the table. We've developed expertise and, and we of working with the private sector, of course, working with the banking sector and bringing science to the table that's sort of what we do and very much what we hope to engage with here hands-on pioneering solutions methodologies based on science um, having a, a common denominator that will enable a more level playing field um, and really uh, different companies in different uh, countries can engage on where they think they have a weak link and where they want to to stretch and and strengthen. So we're very, very pleased to engage um, with the OECD and with this platform moving ahead. Inga Anderson, thank you for setting the tone as we move to the rest of the webinar and for giving us your time today. It's my pleasure. Okay, let's now move to the first of our two panels and talk about the importance of convergence for mainstreaming sustainability related standards, as well as what more there is to do. I am delighted to be joined today by Janine Gio, CEO of the Valley Reporting Foundation, Tajinda Singh, who's the Deputy Secretary General of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, Mark Goff, who's the CEO of the Capitals Coalition, and Nathan Fabien, who's the Chief Responsible Investment Officer of the PRI. Thank you all for being with us today. So Janine, I'm gonna start with you. And the question I have for you, you, we've seen the most extraordinary progress on sustainability related disclosure to meet investors needs over the last year. And it's really illustrated the importance of convergence to achieve mainstreaming. For context, can I ask you to elaborate briefly on the relationship between sustainability related disclosure to meet investors needs and companies broader management of their sustainability. Thanks, Clara, and, and thanks to the Impact Management Project. I think one of the most significant things we accomplished over the last couple of years is trying to um, streamline language and create common language to even talk about sustainability disclosure. And one thing that I think was really helpful 
is, is being clear that the concept of sustainability disclosure exists in two dimensions. One is uh, disclosure of how sustainability issues impact a business's value over time, and then the concept of how sustainability issues and a company's management of sustainability issues impact society. So I think that framing was very helpful, but I, I think we still live with kind of three big uh, misconceptions around that language. Um, first and foremost, I often hear people talk about those two concepts as if concepts as if there is a wall between them and there's not. Um, the concept of how sustainability issues impact enterprise value does in fact include societal impacts. It includes issues like greenhouse gas emissions, water usage, diversity and inclusion, uh, product packaging and use of materials and product packaging. So the enterprise value lens does in fact provide insight into a company's impacts. What it doesn't do though is provide insight into all of a company's impacts. And that's why the enterprise value lens is just one part of a broader disclosure landscape. Um, the, other, the other very common misconception that I hear is that the enterprise value lens is only relevant to impacts on the financial accounts or financial statements. That also is not true. Um, enterprise value by definition is a much, much bigger number. It is the entire value of a company. And today the entire value of a company, and there are numerous quantitative studies on this, um, is heavily, heavily driven by intangibles. In some industries, up to 90% of the value of a company is intangible value. And so what sustainability related financial disclosure for investors does is it provides insight into societal impacts that are drivers of intangible value. So I think those are those are the two uh, big areas, Clara, where I still think we have a lot more work to do on developing a common language. Thank you. And those are great points, Janine. And actually, you personally have been at the heart of significant changes in the landscape of sustainability related disclosure this year. Can I ask you to share your perspective on why, in your own experience, coordination between voluntary standard setters and sometimes even complete consolidation is critical for mainstreaming? Sure, sure. And I've, I've done two mergers this year, <laughs> which is not something I would really recommend anyone do. But um, I think that we've learned two things really drove both the SASB and IIRC merger, and the uh, ultimate merger then of the merged SASB and IIRC, the, the planned merger into IFRS Foundation. And there are three things that really drove us. One was being responsive to market demand. We heard overwhelming uh, demand from both companies and investors to simplify the landscape. And we wanted to be responsive to that market demand. Uh, we felt that if we weren't, and if collectively all of us weren't, um, it's a barrier to further action because companies just get confused and don't know what to do. So we really needed to simplify the landscape. Um, second big big desire was we felt that organizational consolidation was necessary to simplify the landscape. Through the years, there have been many attempts to map frameworks or align frameworks, but that still results in a lot of, um, a lot of confusion because you're still using different language to describe similar things. So we felt organizational consolidation was the only way to simplify the landscape. And then the third big driver, and I think this is true broadly, often in the nonprofit space, um, people kind of hit this certain amount of scale, and then it's difficult to fund, to grow to the next level of scale. And we felt it was important to create fewer organizations, better funded with more scale that can have more impact. So that's what drove, drove us, Clara. Thank you, that's really helpful. And as a, a reminder for our audience, we're reflecting on the ISSB, the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation new board, because it's a really good case study of what this 
cooperation between everyone has been able to achieve already. And I think it inspires, therefore, what can now be achieved further through the platform. It's certainly not the only the only case study. And I think one of the things I've been really encouraged by this year, actually, is even there are some really interesting cooperations emerging, even between voluntary standard setters and standard setters within jurisdictions themselves. So, for example, GRI and FRAG under the European Commission co-constructing and shifts joining them. So I think the spirit of cooperation is, is in the air. And, um, and with that, I wanted to come to, to Jinder. And, and to Jinder, you know, last week, the formation of the um, of the ISSB, it was it was announced at COP, but it continued to be talked about in press, and it I think it is very much on people's minds as an example of a move to mainstream. IOSCO played a key role in that development, and what I'd love you to share with us today is is a stepping back view of from a regulatory perspective. Why is it that, that convergence among the voluntary initiatives, the way that Janine has described? is a really important step if we're thinking about mainstream from a regulated perspective. Thank you, Clara. Yes, indeed, the COP26 announcements were a significant milestone and marked the successful culmination of the first stage of the journey that the IFRS Foundation and IOSCO are undertaking together. Let me just recap why this project is so important for securities regulators, and then I'll get to the convergence point. So for sustainable finance to work at scale, as was just mentioned, uh, public finance won't be enough and therefore properly functioning capital markets are indispensable. For capital markets to function properly, the key element is of course trust. So security regulators and IOSCO have three key objectives, investor protection, market integrity, and financial stability. All these objectives are engaged in sustainable finance and they are all about trust. Investors trusting that they are not misled. So the point about greenwashing was mentioned a couple of times market participants trusting that markets have integrity and the trust of the public at large that financial stability is maintained. Information disclosure is a key foundational element of this trust and of meeting these objectives. And therefore, the development, application, and enforcement of disclosure regulations that promote fair, efficient, and transparent capital markets is an important part of our job. Over the last couple of years at IOSCO, we have conducted research and held roundtables on whether investors' information needs are being sufficiently met when it comes to sustainability-related disclosure. Participants consistently stress three things. First, that sustainability-related disclosure is critical for meeting investors' needs and therefore relevant to IOSCO's objective to ensure that issuers deliver information that is material to investors' decisions on an ongoing basis. Second, that sustainability-related disclosure is already being practiced by companies on a voluntary basis, and asset managers see value in companies reporting systematically against these established voluntary frameworks and standards. In particular, the existence of the voluntary standards give a good insight into what future standards could look like. For instance, the existing initiatives demonstrated that asset managers value investor-oriented, industry-specific information across sustainability categories, and this is not just about climate, they value a mix of narrative information and quantitative metrics. And they want to see the linkage between a company's sustainability risks and opportunities on the one hand, and its business strategy and financials on the other. And third, and very importantly for us, that voluntary disclosure would not be enough. We need clear pathways towards mandatory reporting requirements aligned across jurisdictions, along with robust frameworks for audit and assurance. It is the combination of these three factors that creates the right environment for an organization like mine, like IOSCO, to step in. And existing initiatives have been key to pave the way. But there was a further step that has been critical to the rapid progress made this year. And that is the willingness of the existing initiatives to work together. I can say, personally speaking, that it is one of only a few examples where voluntary bodies have come together in the public interest. And thanks, of course, also to the leadership of the IMP and, and you, Clara. The IWSB has just launched with a running start because the investor-focused initiatives recognize the importance of convergence. And as I mentioned, investors are looking for industry specificity, narrative information as well as quantitative metrics, and the linkage between a company's sustainability risks and opportunities on the one hand and its financials on the other. And therefore, this combination of the voluntary frameworks is a great starting point to meet these needs. 
And we saw that the teams of these voluntary bodies, and Janine was mentioning, uh, and has been a key part of that, they have worked tirelessly together for the last six months. And IOSCO has been an observer to the technical preparation. And two of them have now committed to consolidate into the IFRS Foundation and its new board. And it is inspiring to see organizations converge to fulfill their shared missions. And last but not the least, this building on voluntary frameworks provides one of the two interoperabilities that IOSCO has been aiming for. As we look for the global baseline to be interoperable with national regulations, and I know that Europe was mentioned, EFRAG was mentioned, the fact that many national authorities were already looking at the voluntary standards should make this interoperability easier and therefore for allow the global baseline to be truly global. So thank you, Clara, uh, for, for this question. Thank you, Tajinda. And IOSCO actually played a very important role in calling for a sustainability consultative committee to advise the new ISSB as a key feature. And it was established at COP26 alongside the launch of the new board. As the Secretary General of the OECD has just mentioned, the Sustainability Consultative Committee's permanent members include multilaterals who form the steering committee of the platform that's launching today. Why is it important to have a link between multilateral organizations looking at sustainable development broadly and standards focused on meeting the information needs of, of global capital markets to gender? Sure, thanks. And, and as Janine has, has said, sustainability related financial disclosure addresses the intersection between sustainability and enterprise value. And the new IWSP will be tasked with setting sustainability standards that meet the needs of investors developed through public consultation and extensive due process, just as the IASB does with financial accounting standards. And all of this is subject to robust governance with the oversight by the monitoring board that is chaired by IOSCO and technical content that is commented on by IOSCO experts. However, for the IWSB to develop its agendas for consultation and its exposure drafts of standards, it must be informed about wider priority sustainability matters and related technical protocols, as well as significant interdependencies between sustainability matters. And we know that such advice does come from organizations with deep and recognized experience on sustainability matters across environmental, social, and economic considerations, according to those three pillars of sustainability, sustainable development and the SDGs. We also know that such advice must take into account a broad range of geographical interests and different stages of economic development, including that of emerging markets. And that is why we in IOSCO called for a sustainability consultative committee as a key input to the IWSP and have worked with the IFRS Foundation and its multilateral working group to develop this concept. It has been a pleasure over the course of this year to observe the IFRS Foundation's multilateral working group develop a terms of reference that will kickstart the formation of this important committee. And the permanent members of the Susten Sustainability Consultative Committee, which will be populated, includes the, the multilaterals that I was mentioning and that will provide the steering committee for the platform that is being launched today. Through the IWSB, we are aiming to equip capital market participants with the right information to price investment capital today on how sustainability matters will impact companies in the long term. This in turn provides companies with the incentive to improve their sustainability performance and it provides the second of the two interoperabilities that I talked about, that between the wider sustainability impacts and the enterprise value creation through the IWSP. It is therefore great to see this platform launching for guiding the market on how to improve sustainability, which is complementary to the point about how to disclose it and on which we have been working to work together with the IFRS Foundation. Thank you, thank you for being with us today and for your comments. Nathan, I, I want to come to you and I want to switch gears. So we've, we've taken a look back and we've looked at one case study of where coordination has led to a mainstream result in the last year. But I now want to look forward. We are going to switch in a minute to a platform of the multilaterals talking about where they're going to go. But I would love to hear from you, Nathan, and then I'd love to invite Mark to also come in on you know, the perspective of investors and companies. PRI has played a key role in guiding mainstream investors to navigate sustainability issues. And like our previous speakers, actually, PRI has called for convergence when it comes to sustainability-related disclosure to meet investor needs. 
But what are the broader resources that investors still need to improve the sustainability of their investments? What are the other priority areas where you think we really need greater coherence or convergence there in terms of standards and guidance? Thank you, Clara. Yes, I would echo, echo uh, the important step that's been taken on ISSB provides us a necessary foundation. And thank you to everyone who has worked so hard. Investors have called for this for a long time. But I think now that we are in this time of the three crises that Inga referred to, we do need to look a bit more broadly. And I think we can learn a lot from the GFANS and the, uh, commitments at the COP just recently. All of these financial actors have gotten together to contribute to sustainability goals, such as limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, to stopping deforestation, to phasing out rather than down fossil fuels. And so the point is that the, the markets are waking up to the idea that it is the sustainability outcomes that matter now. And so it is the link between our sustainability practice and our planetary boundaries and the planetary systems we rely on that we must give greater attention. And so as we think about developing our enterprise value concept, and as we think about uh, delivering on these goals, we need to focus on that nexus between sustainability and planetary boundaries. And the truth is that I think in the market, we've still got lots of principles and guidance and tools and actually, these are not very precise. Helpful, but not very precise. And then at the other end, we've got governments saying, actually, we see a gap too, because we're setting the goals and we know that we need the market to move fast. And so we're getting governments starting to step in with a range of regulations, often which don't connect and sometimes duplicate obligations uh, on uh, not doing harm, on articulating uh, uh, sorry, environmental contribution, uh, on being good stewards. And so there are literally dozens of new regulations which we are going to need to try and draw the links between so we can clarify these uh, performance expectations on how business and, and finance contributes to realising the goals. And Nathan, as you think about the work to be done through this platform, where are the big gaps from your perspective? What should be the, the first priorities that we need solving for, and particularly that really require a collective to solve for them? Yeah, so I think if, if you look at the website, there's a fantastic model for the different elements of the framework that we need, and I just draw attention to a few of them. We know we need sustainability goals by public actors, and climate's good, but there needs to be more. <laughs> Biodiversity, pollution water, circular economy, and we need to have a renewed effort on our social institutions and norms. It's time to be more granular on this as well. And so this is a key piece. We know we need science-based targets and we know we need socially, social institution-based targets. And crucially, I think we need sustainability performance benchmarks and reporting at asset activity and entity level on the sustainability performance relative to the goal. Sometimes that will inform our understanding of the financial and risk decision we need to make. Sometimes it will inform a decision about the type of business we want to be and the consumers and, and customers and stakeholders we impact. Both are legitimate are uses for that information. And then of course we need reporting on the planned actions and we need to track the actual impacts. Uh, the goals and our contribution to meeting them, is it having the impact that we need? Are we getting closer to achieving the goals or are we not? But if I can say, I think the key linking, linking piece here, markets work well with benchmarks. Let's bring these broader societal goals into performance benchmarks for markets and let's use them at the asset activity and entity level. Uh, and then we'll be making some real progress. So that's one area I hope we can make some, some really substantial progress on in the platform. Thanks so much, Nathan. And for those of you who are exploring the website of the platform, which is impactmanagementplatform.org, you will see that there's a, there's a short video which, which begins to dig into what Nathan's describing in terms of thinking about goals, thresholds, allocations, and how that also can link to Janine's point to enterprise value considerations. And so I encourage you to take a look at that if this area is newer to you.
Mark, I want to come to you from the corporate perspective. You work with hundreds of corporations. You've worked in one yourself. So you're extremely familiar with probably where you want to see more convergence personally. But I want you to use your whole coalition behind you at the Capital Coalition. Reflect on, from your perspective, where are you seeing this call for clarity, this call for greater convergence? What should be the priorities? So thank you, Clara. Um, I very much agree that this is a moment where things are coming together. We've just united very recently the valuation space, natural, social and human capital, all coming together, trying to consolidate. It's great to see the ISSB now doing that as well. And this is a moment where we do need to start curving back round towards consolidation and harmonization. And we've been lots of flowers blooming for some time. And as we've heard from a corporate perspective, uh, we do get very confused when we see all these different initiatives, very much welcome them, but we need some clarification there. And I think the thing is, is that disclosure is extremely important for corporates. It's obviously something we have to do all the time through to investors and others, but there's lots of other things that are going on as well, whether it's the benchmarking, whether it's the audit processes, whether it's those internal targets or the allocations and thresholds that we've got to try and work within. All of that work is all coming together as a system. And disclosure, although a very important part of it, we've got to be doing things during the day that we can then disclose at the end of the day of what we've achieved. And therefore, there's a lot of work going on at the moment trying to bring that together. And one of the things we're doing, in fact, with the Impact Management Project is we're curating this value accounting network. So we're bringing together now all of those that are starting to think about what is value. So not just the measurements and the metrics you might have, but what does that actually mean? What's the context? behind that? What does that actually mean to society and mean to the business? What is the enterprise value that comes from that? So included in that is Social Value International, S&P, the Impact Weighted Accounts, the Value Balancing Alliance, and many, many others, including the national level accounts, bringing all of that together. So I think that the more that we can get to that granularity that Nathan was just talking about, the better it's going to be. The more information we have, the better decisions we can make in business, the better we'll be able to act and therefore, the better we'll be able to disclose clearly and transparently through the things such as the ISSB is doing. Mark, again, looking for your advice as we head into the next panel, what do you as a partner in this platform think we should be prioritizing? Where are the most urgent gaps in your view? So the, the website really is brilliant. If you haven't had a look yet, please do take a look. Um, all of the value accounting network I just mentioned will be coming through. There's a page there already actually on the, um, what's it called, estimate value creation um, there. So that will be definitely, will be updating that. I think the thing is, is that it's got to be a living space that actually there's so many advances that are going on now. So your call at the beginning, Clara, that we should actually be inviting people here to contribute is exactly where we should should be going with this. There's lots of things happening and we need to use this as the authoritative base for what we mean by impact, for what we mean by these things. And we've gone through a lot of work, a lot of difficult conversations to get to this point. Let's back this one up. Let's get behind it. Let's make sure that these things that we're coming out with on this site really can help to identify where we're going next. Of course, I would come back down to we've got to move away from just metrics into actually understanding what those metrics mean, what is the impact we're having, what is the dependency we have on nature and people there. And I think that's something we're gonna see coming through here very clearly. Great, well, I wanna thank all of my panelists for setting the tone as we move to the next panel. And I just wanna remind people, this is a launch event. So it's not the dialogue that we want to have now through the platform. And I just really wanna say this again, please go leave your comments, criticize, Celebrate, tell, tell the, the people who are stewarding this platform what you need to see from a market perspective and it will deliver what you want, but it, it relies entirely on your engagement. And for those of you who are not practitioners, your initiatives yourselves, and you're wondering how to coordinate, how might you be part of this coming together? There is a terms of reference, it's been worked on for some months now by all of, of the members of the platform and that will be published in the new year. So that clarity on what, what does it mean to be a partner? Why are you a partner? We'll, we'll be there for everyone to see. So just please know that that's coming, but, but today is the launch. So we've just had Eric Usher join us, the head of, of UNIPFI. And Eric, it's my pleasure to hand, hand the mic to you to take us through our next panel. Great, thanks very much, Clara. And, and thanks, Jenny and Tejinder and Nathan and Mark. Uh, you know, great discussion. 
um, uh, you know, I think when we bring organizations together, we start to really see the potential of um, uh, convergence, as we've been hearing, mainstreaming, as we've been hearing, and very significant developments uh, in Glasgow uh, through the announcements made there. And uh, Ajinder, particularly, I like the, you know, the description uh, where you were saying, what's how do voluntary frameworks and developments link to, to um, the follow-on from, from uh, the regulatory side, from uh, how do we go from testing to, to really uh, mainstreaming and, and, and scale up. So with that, um, uh, we're going to uh, bring on um, a group of the organizations, the multilaterals who are directly involved. And um, uh, I, mean, I can certainly say from UNIPFI that, you know, making this sort of commitment and, and stepping up to the plate, as we can say, on cooperation between entities, I think is just as important in many ways as, as the work itself. And really delighted that uh, we have the opportunity going forward and, and my specific role to be able to co-chair along with uh, Romina Borini, who's the director of the OECD WISE Center. Uh, Romina, can I give to you to open on your end? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so good morning, thanks, Eric, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the OECD, we are uh, really delighted to co-chair this important initiative with Eric and his team and also with the other partners. And so we're going to continue working with the many multilaterals and the partners of the impact management platform to further develop the practice of impact management. And so, first of all, I'd like to reiterate big, big thanks to the IMP team, of course, that has worked under uh, the leadership of Clara. They, they, they did a great job uh, in the last three years where they facilitated the structured network. And this has really enabled us to reach uh, this important new phase of collaborations within the stand, between the standard setting organizations. As we have noted earlier uh, throughout the discussion this afternoon, uh, global issues like COVID-19 and the climate, climate crisis have highlighted the interconnections of social, environmental and economic challenges. And this really is the core of what IMP uh, is going to concentrate on going forward. Uh, we have many examples uh, from our work that really suggest that uh, we need to uh, connect those issues and really look at the ways uh, companies, investors and governments really are working together to address these challenges. This is the mission of uh, the OECD Wise Centre. We put people's well-being at the centre of governments and business actions. And we've been generating uh, data, evidence and insights for actions that underpin a new economic model that is working for all and is socially and environmentally sustainable. And so we have been confronting this question of what is progress, how we define progress, how we define performance, and that entails looking at the social environmental implications and externalities. And so certainly the key objective we are uh, working on in the OECD is to define measurement and management standards that focus on people's well-being, but that are profoundly aligned across the governments, the corporates, and the investors. And this is so why the new IMP platform is so important. Uh, to achieve this, and in fact, this platform will have a powerful role, not only in bringing together existing standards, tools, and guidance of partners as the market continues to evolve, but actually this platform will also identify and address gaps in the systems of standards. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Romina. So now I've, you've heard the rationale of the platform. So this final segment really is to look at, you know, what exactly will the partners be focusing on together? Uh, we're gonna talk about three areas of work. Uh, first on clarifying the landscape, the second on the coordination or interoperability of, of approaches, and the third on what we call the joint R&D program on efforts to move things forward. So firstly, in terms of the partners, um, how we're gonna to work together to clarify the landscape of impact tools and approaches. Now, last week, as we've heard, uh, the platform website was, was released. Um, Mark referred to it now. Um, it's a good uh, starting resource, I think, for what's out there. You know, it provides an overview of the different types of the different, let's say, the constituent parts uh, of um, actions around impact management. Um, you know, it kind of tries to explain things like impact identification, measurement, uh, uh, assessment. What do these things mean? Uh, we're looking for feedback um, and going forward to consolidate and keep growing this, this resource. Uh, in terms of um, definitions and explanations, uh, they are important. There's a lot of devil in the detail. And, and um, I think building on this um, equally or more important um, for the landscape, the principles is the norms and resources to actually function as complete in a coherent system. And to this end, uh, we have two further areas of work in our work program. On the one hand, um, 
we understand that the, the, the market needs interoperability between the different frameworks and tools you're using. And we've heard that now earlier in the session repeatedly. Um, we need to use a platform to coordinate uh, upcoming work um, so that parties are working together to be truly, I think, complementary and, and engaging uh, together and bringing in um, additional partners and actors um, on uh, new initiatives that get created and, and organizations to ensure that these are likewise, uh, you know, uh, plugged in or ready to be plugged in um, into an ecosystem uh, of norms and, and to ensure that um, over time, you know, the topical sectoral and geographic gaps uh, are getting filled. I think on the other hand, uh, the platform is gonna help us to work together on systemic issues and gaps that require our collective um, rather than individual action. And uh, this we've taken to refer to as our joint R&D program. It's where we, we wanna start tackling fundamental things such as common sustainability definitions, uh, the fit for purpose industry uh, classifications or uh, digital and governance solutions for uh, impact data collection and sharing. So uh, I, I'm delighted we're going to dig into a little bit more in these areas uh, and I'm very happy to be joined by other members of steering committee. And that includes Neil Gregory, who's chief thought leadership officer from the International Finance Corporation, Lila uh, Carbasi, the chief of programs for the UN Global Compact and Marcus Neto, the Director for the Finance Sector Hub at the UN Development Program. Um, so first off, if I could just ask you to share your, uh, your, your own perspectives on this future collaboration and overall how, how you see uh, IMP uh, operating. Neil, could I start with you? Great, thank you, Eric. And thank you, everybody. It's, it's great uh, progress, I think, that brought us to the, the launch of this, this new phase of the work. And, I think from our perspective, looking at it both uh, as an investor ourselves, but also uh, as an organization that has as part of our mission to mobilize more private investors into investing uh, for the sustainable development goals in emerging markets. But we see that the evolution of this platform as being something which is, is very helpful for investors in, in learning to navigate how to go beyond just investing for uh, sustainability, but actually investing for positive impact and for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. I think we've been on a journey over the past couple of years through the, the structured network that was convened by the Impact Management Project, and that brought people together into the same room that necessarily, hadn't necessarily talked to each other much before. And I think one of the key uh, connections that this work program is making is between the world of corporate sustainability reporting and the, the world of investor reporting. But increasingly, as investors, we want to report on the uh, social and environmental impact of our investments. But those, are, uh, those impacts are derived from the performance of the firms that we're investing in. So uh, rather than develop a whole separate set of methodologies and metrics uh, which uh, are driven by investors, in the long term, it makes more sense for uh, the sustainability reporting at the level of firms and corporates to also deliver on the, the information and the metrics that investors need to gather to understand the impacts of their investments in those firms. And so I think the impact management platform, by bringing together the frameworks and tools for, for corporate sustainability reporting and impact measurements, uh, with the perspective of investors uh, like ourselves and the private investors uh, that we work with helps to, to make that connection. But what that means in the longer run is that instead of investors going to corporates having to ask for bespoke information and customized data and imposing additional reporting burdens, we will be able to uh, make use of standard metrics and reporting formats that have been developed at the level of firms. And one of the pieces, I think, of, of, of unfinished business, which I think has already been picked up a little bit in the chat, is that as we develop these corporate uh, reporting uh, standards and frameworks, we need to make sure that they're fit for purpose for different types of enterprise, that our focus is on investing in firms in low and middle income countries, many of whom uh, are smaller, medium sized enterprises. We need to make sure that the frameworks and the standards that are being developed aren't just fit for purpose for the, the large uh, uh, global 500 companies, but they also are, are adaptable and scalable so they can be used 
uh, by smaller and early stage enterprises uh, in lower middle income countries as well as in high income countries. So I think uh, the, the work that's been done today and the convergence that we've seen today has been very important, but I think we have an exciting and ambitious uh, further convergence agenda uh, in front of us. So we're very happy to be part of the, the steering committee for the platform with the other multilaterals, but equally importantly, look forward to engaging with a wide range of stakeholders uh, from the private sector, from civil society, as we continue to push this agenda forward. Great, well, thanks very much, Neil. And um, the, the multilateral development banks and particularly the IFC have been critical in um, uh, helping in emerging markets in the global south um, uh, implement the notion of uh, environmental social safeguards. And so from a risk perspective, really putting in place the systems and the common methodologies about how do you do that? How do you ensure when you invest that you're not going to create environmental or social negative impacts? Um, at the same time, I think an IFC is um, considers itself an impact um, organization by mandate. And yet, and has been doing that for years and has a lot of metrics and measures about how you measure the outcomes of your or impacts of your investments. Although now we're at a new stage, I think, of development where those in the private sector are realizing the need, you know, based on announcements like the ISSB uh, uh, two weeks back, is we need to get better at actually understanding a little bit what does it mean to be an IFC, I think, as, as a commercial actor in terms of accounting, not only for the financial risks and returns, the opportunities, uh, but also the impacts of our investments and obviously the impact on, on enterprise value, as we heard from the last session. So let's um, um, let's move to, to Lila. Lila, you're with the, uh, the Global Compact and uh, it's really the largest uh, relationship between the UN system and, and the private sector globally, including, well, in, in, in all markets. What does impact mean? Um, you embody the UN system, but in the interface that you have um, with corporates worldwide, how do you see this platform helping Global, Global Compact deliver on your mandate? Thanks, Eric. And uh, first of all, we've been a proud partner of the uh, impact management platform, and we're very pleased with the results uh, today and the launch of this online uh you know sets of tools and, and resources to understand uh impact management and consolidate uh the work that a lot of actors uh have been doing uh standard setters reporting frameworks international organizations like uh like ours and so big congratulations to the imp team for uh, taking us to where we are today and uh, for the leadership in terms of identifying that need for consolidation and clarity. Um, and equally, we've been very impressed by the speed at which the announcement of the um, uh, ISSB has been made uh, at COP26. And, uh, and uh, this is a remarkable development. Uh, I think uh, you refer to it as a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity and uh, it's a much needed um, development to also bring clarity in terms of what the expectations are and uh, what the, uh, uh, you know, the recommendations are for uh, disclosure of risks, opportunities and performance. Uh, we see our, our role at the Global Compact very much as uh, building the pipeline of uh, uh, companies that will report on high performance around sustainability metrics. Uh, 14,000 companies that are part of the Global Compact today coming from 140 countries. Uh, and uh, our role with our country offices is to prepare the market for high performance around the disclosure of, uh, of metrics. Uh, we're, we're very pleased also to be part of the science-based target uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, we've recently uh, launched a net zero corporate um, framework and, and standard basically to understand uh, what is required from uh, the emitters, you know, actually the emitters of data, but the emitters of, of CO2 and, and greenhouse gas emission as well, uh, to halve emissions by 2030, 
uh, rapid and fast action and uh, to reduce emissions by 90 to 95 percent by 2050. So that brings a level of clarity in terms of what uh, the expectations are. Um, and it's good to see that the ISSB will um, focus on climate first uh, because it's a mature area. Uh, we have a good understanding. It's a simple metrics, metric to measure. Uh, lots of tools and frameworks that exist to enable uh, clear reporting on that. Uh, and uh, we would love to partner uh, further to expand uh, the scope to other topics as well, topics that relate to nature, but also topics uh, that relate to uh, social sustainability, uh, diversity, gender equality, uh, workplace issues, living wage, uh, topics that we know down the line are going to become financially, you know, material for, uh, for investors as well. And uh, in our own work at the Global Compact, we are issuing a set of metrics on uh, our principles around human rights, uh, labor, the environment, and, and anti-corruption. And we see, uh, you know, the work that we're doing uh, as a complement to what exists, and that's very strong in the area of environment, but you know, uh, perhaps less strong in the area in the in the areas of human rights, labor rights, and anti-corruption, but equally important. So. We're building a pipeline of companies and we're building a pipeline of understanding on topics around uh, social performance uh, that uh, may not exist at the same level of environmental performance today. Great, thank you very much, Lila. I'm going to come back to you uh, in a few minutes as we start to um, think a little bit more about some of these issues. But first I would like to bring in um, Marcus Neto um, now, the uh, UN Development Program, um, uh, well, does many things, one of which is working with countries on establishing their, their integrated national financing frameworks, the INFF, so which is kind of the big picture uh, view on, on uh, well, frameworks that are going to uh, realize the mobilization of, of financial resources towards uh, certain um, national priorities, including certainly the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Climate Action, uh, and more. Um, Marcos, your team, you are also the Secretariat of the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. And I have to congratulate you uh, first on the uh, reestablishment uh, um, and, and the upgrade of that group from a study group to a working group and the very powerful role that the G20 can play, I think, in uh, putting forward, um, well, objectives that help underline and, and, and attract the, the role of governments, including regulators and policymakers, to these issues. And you have just released through that work a five-year roadmap for the work of, of, the, um, of the G20 uh, in this area. So could you tell us from your perspective, um, how do you see impact management, the, the IMP platform, what role, how does that feed into these other moving parts? Um, thanks, Eric. Uh, first of all, let me thank you and, and Romina for you know, stepping up and, and, and becoming the co-chairs in this new phase. And to Neil and to Lila to, to, to join all of us in this steering committee. And obviously, I think, as everybody said, a great thanks to Clara and the team for having to usher all the impact management project up to now. Um, I think for us at UNDP, being part of this platform in the past and in this next interaction is really strategic because at the end of the day, um, as we heard from the last session, uh, the last panel, you are coming to a moment that the voluntary standards and the voluntary work is no longer going to be sufficient. Um, and you need to start connecting the dots between what governments are putting in place um, and what has existed so far, right? So we're not gonna throw the baby with bath of water here. And I think the, I, the, the ISSB is an important piece of that. But as we heard as well, it's not enough and it's not going to cover all the aspects of impact, all the aspects of materiality, if you want to say. Now, I think it was very interesting to hear from Nathan that says that the world is full of principles and full of big things, but we need to get down to the granularity. And that, got, that down to the granularity is both at the enterprise level and investment in companies, as you mentioned, as well as a government, as the regulatory framework. And we've got to make sure that the regulation comes to contribute and to drive 
that innovation, to drive that integrity of impact forward, rather than to put us backwards from all that we already are in this process. And I think the, the platform that we are creating today does has a, that we are, you know, taking to the next level, does has a, 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 an important role to play to complement, for example, the work that ISSB will do, right? I think for us, should be a lot of the focus, as it was Ramina mentioned, on the gaps, right? So if you've got a gap, being on, you know, the entire society impact, being on the interactions between environmental climate and the social aspects, I think that's where a lot we, we needed to deal with this. While we don't really might not need it to be too focused on enterprise values or climates, because there's a lot already going on in there, but let's take on and lead and complement this ecosystem with the new stuff in that sense. Now, if you look at from that complementary point of view, um, governments will benefit from that because governments are also the G20 and Sustainable Finance Roadmap. It's also struggling in the same way that the enterprise is doing, right? From the point of view of, you know, yeah, we understand climate, it is relatively easy. A CO2 emission is a CO2 emission. How do I deal with the rest? How do I actually regulate it and incentivize an entire SDG impact rather than pieces of it, right? So I think the work we're doing here can connect back to the regulatory framework quite well in that sense. Now, this whole game, this whole ecosystem needs to be very holistic, right? You know, we can't pass on sustainability. We need to deal with all aspects, social, environmental, uh, nature, climate, economic, as well as the aspects of enterprise value and larger impact. Um, and for us to deal with that, I think we need to look at um, reporting and disclosure as important as it is, is not enough, right? We actually need to get into the business model. We actually need to get into the decision-making, right? That leads a company to make uh, an investment or to decide to adjust the business model here and the business model there, right? So I think that decision-making becomes very, very important. Um, we at UNDP have um, spent some time the last three years working around the standards for that decision-making, you know, and, and we've got a series of standards together with OECD um, for different stakeholders. And that's part of the architecture that we have in this platform with all of you. And actually we think, that the combination of disclosure, reporting, decision-making, all that complexity is what really can make that systemic change. And which, you know, what, what we also can offer from, from the national level with the INFFs that you mentioned, as well as, you know, the support we provided to G20 is at some point connected the public policy side with the impact conversation that is coming in here to find that sweet spot that allows regulation to come in in a way that contributes and accelerate, right? The transition that needs to happen, uh, um, minimizing any of the troubles that new regulation sometimes can cause, especially because we are not starting from scratch. I think that is a lot of voluntary work that happened that needs to be recognized and then codified in that aspect. So for us, that's that's how I think we, we come together. But I would just say that it is very important that as, as a platform, avoid the duplication, let others do what they're doing. And I think we, we understand this ecosystem pretty well and using the website already. And then maybe Eric, now we can get into that. What excites me the most, which is the joint R&D, you know, take to the future, take the next challenge, right? That we then contribute both to the enterprise side as well as to, to the government side. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos. Let me pick up on that. I mean, we've been hearing about uh, including on the last panel, the very important developments. I mean, one of the most important aspects of the IFRS announcement three weeks ago was not only something new, but was convergence of existing actors. And, and uh, we've heard from Janine and Tajinder and others about how that's come up, up, about. And I think that that's incredibly important. We've also heard about you know, notions of mainstreaming and the fact that, that this is only going to be impactful if you really are becoming a strategic aspect of how you do business rather than an, an add-on, which we have to admit, historically, there's been a lot of development. Often these issues are seen as something you do at the margins beside 
provides business as usual. And, and the question now is how, how are we seeing ch changes in how business will be done? Uh, the need for interoperability of approaches and how do we make sure that even if there are different approaches out there that they link together, they make sense. So could I come back to then um, uh, all of you and, uh, and Romina also welcome from you as well. I'm gonna come back to you at the end to sum up, but I'm just wondering it, the, the ISSB is being created now. We're setting up this platform to support, to be a little bit of a sandbox in terms of how we can develop the approaches interoperability. Where in three, four, five years time, where do we hope to be? And I think what we realize coming out of Glasgow, at least on the climate topic, is uh, you know a mind-boggling level of commitment. We talk about the 130 trillion that Mark Carney bought under the GFANS umbrella. We know the next step now is about implementation, interim targets with measurable implementation. That's just on the climate objective. Here we're talking about a wider objective, not only climate. How can we measure success in three or five years' time? What are we hoping to see within the wider space? And what role do we believe that the IMP platform can play in that? Neil, could I come back to you on that? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And uh, that's a great question. Um, I think you know, one thing we've heard a lot about today is the need to converge on, on common metrics going beyond just uh, the climate metrics. And this is an area where I think this will be of great value to investors and deciding how to allocate capital. They want to be able to compare opportunities uh, for impact using uh, common metrics, just like they can uh, opportunities for financial return using standard financial uh, accounting. So I think there's been a lot of progress in, in the climate metrics, thanks to uh, TCFD. Um, we've also worked um, with, with partners uh, like the Gin, and others uh, to develop common metrics uh, for, for gender impacts. I saw some comments in the chat about how it's harder and less progress has been made on social impact measurement and environmental impact measurement. So there's an example of that. We've also worked on common metrics for uh, measuring the, the, the impact on, on job creation. So I think we, we have started to show that on some very important cross-cutting themes um, like, like gender and climate in jobs that it is possible to converge and develop a core of metrics which can be reported on by a wide range of firms and used by a wide range of investors. There will always be additional custom metrics that are specific to the particular enterprise or a specific investor interest, but I think this is the direction we want to go in over the next few years is, is really uh, developing that, that core set of metrics which can be widely used which can be the basis for benchmarking, for uh, comparing performance across investment port portfolios. Um, and I think we, we, we've made a, a good start on that and shown that it's possible to do that. And I think we have the right people around the table and the, and the partners for this impact management platform to continue those conversations and make progress. Great, thanks very much, Neil. Lila, what is the Global Compact community looking for? What are they gonna be measuring success on in three, five years time? I would say two things um, to be realistic. One is um, disclosure to be mandated. And I think we're on a good path with uh, the developments at the moment. Uh, and uh, that would lead to a better understanding of risks if we take the area of climate, uh, first of all, with the work that the, the TCFD has done, uh, having this become a uh, sort of regulation uh, uh, through all these developments, uh, that would help in terms of decision making, in terms of capital allocation. So that's extremely important. And I think it's realistic to think that we, uh, we will get there. So that's the first one. Um, it's probably not going to be enough. Uh, if we can mandate performance, uh, then we have a much more direct way of uh, getting at decision making and cap capital allocation. So, for example, um, our wish would be that uh, five years from now, from now um, there will be a sort of requirement for all companies, listed companies, uh, by shareholders to have a science-based target in place, meaning a way to have a credible pathway to reduce emissions over the next five to 10 years 
halving emissions over the next five to 10 years, reducing emissions by 90 to 95 percent, not using offsets, those reduction, emissions reductions being part of the, the value chain. Uh, offsets and investments in nature are welcome beyond the value chain, but they do not count for the purposes of decarbonization. So we have a very credible you know, pathway for decarbonization um, and uh, verified you know, independently through a body like SBTI. So our, our wish would be that this becomes uh, mandatory in terms of the actual performance uh, of reducing CO2. And I talked also earlier about expanding the scope from CO2 to, to other uh, metrics as well. So that uh, remains as well. Thank you, Leila. So, so impact, once again, is not at the margins. Impact is how we align our entire portfolios here on the climate um, example, but obviously on gender, as we've heard, and in other areas. Uh, do I understand correctly that uh, Rishi Sunak's announcement uh, during COP, is the UK going to be the first to expect uh, UK companies to, to put in place such Paris alignment or, or science-based targets? Who are you addressing the question to? Sorry, to you, Lila. Just uh, I, yeah. I, I think so. And that was remarkable um, and uh, very encouraging. So uh, exactly, hopefully other countries to, to follow. I think the focus should be on, on G20 primarily. Uh, right now, we have 20% of coverage of, um, of the GDP in G20 countries that are um, that you know that that you know for companies that have science-based targets in place, um, G20, G7 first. Uh, there's a big question around equity as well, uh, and an understanding of those countries and, and sectors that have emitted the most to be responsible for rapid decarbonization, but also support. Uh, those that you know are seeing the impacts of climate change and have not been responsible historically for uh, emissions, you know, helping those countries, supporting them to adjust to the effects of uh, of climate change. So, I expect very much that the next COP uh, in Egypt will have the theme of equity, you know, very firmly anchored in all the the discussions. Uh, but I would say G twenty countries primarily for the purposes of decarbonization and mandating things like, you know, what the UK announced. At okay, the well, thank you, Lala. And I think once again, uh, to, to Ginger's point earlier, starting voluntary, but eventually the, the role for, for regulators to come in. Um, I know, um, Marcos, you, you, you will very quickly point out that this agenda is much more than climate. Um, what would you, from a wider SDG or a sustainability lens, what would you see as success three, five years time from this cooperation? Well, I, I actually think that, you know, the SDGs as a piece of business model and investment, uh, central to business model and investment is what I would like to see as a five years. What does that mean in practice? Uh, companies that are able um, not only to do what Lila talked about from the point of view of climate, but actually go beyond, you know, in other words, I fully understand and even proactively understanding from the core business, what is my, what impact environmental, social, and financial do I want to have, right? Determine that impact, right? And then set the system, set the decision-making processes inside, as well as the reporting and the metrics measurement to see how much you're achieving that social and environmental impact. So I would say, um, and that has to go beyond what is material, and it has to really look at the positive and negative impact. I, from an investment point of view, I would love to see, and I think the, you know, you mentioned earlier that, um, and, and, and I absolutely agree with it, the IFC is the, is the mother of all impact investment. It, it, it invented the terms before it existed. The question is, I don't think we need the term. Right, I think we need to go back to the word and to demand that all investments have an impact because all investments have an impact, period. Sometimes the impact is negative, sometimes the impact is positive. What we need in five years is the clarity that all investment needs to minimize its, impact, its negative impacts 
it must maximize its positive impact, right? You know, rather than trying to create a little niche part of market that says, oh, here's where we have impact and here we don't need to have impact. Is the mainstreaming point that you've mentioned earlier, um, Eric, in that aspect. And perhaps the last point it is, you know, regulation. Regulation needs to be in place in five years, needs to be done with private sector, and needs to be support of this transition, but it needs to speed up, scale up, and demand integrity, right? Um, because my, if, if you flip the question, what is the thing that keeps me awake at night? It's a big scandal. It's a big scandal that half of the ESG word is meaningless. It's a big scandal that somebody that said oh, how wonderful I am is meaningless because then we're going to lose, right, the entire momentum that we have right now, you know. So it's great that we have all these pledges. It's great that we have GFAN, but we got to make sure that it happens. Otherwise, people are going to lose its desire to engage in this process. Thank you very much, Marcos. And, and um, I think that's a good way to come back to Romina. Romina, um, I think uh, there's been something in development for many years. Nobody actually thought it would happen, which is the tax agreement. And then in fairly short order, uh, quite incredible how pieces fell in place. And um, I think um, although the um, ISSB, you know, is a very, and the shift towards impact is very important development. We still have some ways to, to, to nail down, I think, to, to Marcos's point, the fact of, you know, how can impact, impact investing where you don't need, actually need the term impact any longer. It's just responsible investing. It's just investing. And um, if I could come back to you, it's a, uh, a big ask. Can you sum up, and we're really pleased to have OECD involved in, in the power of bringing governments together to create standardized approaches, and I think to build up from what is maybe voluntary initially, but then eventually needs to go towards uh, standardization and regulatory um, response. Um, how do you see things going and where do you see from the OECD perspective being the next steps? Well, thanks, uh, Eric, for the question, but also thanks to Neil, Lila and Marcus, I think, for the great points. And uh, certainly the tax example you, you chose, Eric, is very, I think, suggestive and telling indeed about an approach that OECD too can, this is something we work on for more than 15 years. So this is not going to, to happen overnight. And so if, we, if the time horizon we're discussing here, it's next five years, I'm not sure we'll, 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 you, you, we'll, we'll be able to reach that. But indeed, I think the whole point of involving multilaterals and, uh, you know, the, the uh, the partners that we have today uh, in this room is exactly, you know, to steer this conversation and, uh, in fact, having uh, uh, a number of actors working together to agree on a common uh, ground. And that common ground certainly, you know, entails, uh, you know, a discussions around the standards. Uh, it entails, you know, a, a very technical discussions around the data. Uh, and, and many of the other aspects that we've been working uh, you know, together on uh, through the IMP platform. Uh, essentially, uh, it was interesting, I think, if I, if I have to say as well, what are the, our expectations uh, you know, for the next five years? As, as many of you said this afternoon, uh, of course, during COP26, we, we saw a number of commitments by governments, uh, by corporates, by investors. So I think it's we certainly all want to see those things being realized in the next five years from now. So I think the roadmap is there. And uh, what now needs to happen is probably to be a little bit more specific and tangible on the pathways, uh, how to reach those targets. Uh, and so uh, the IMP platform uh, constitutes, I think, wonderful uh, knowledge platform that contains some of that information, because this is indeed, as Marcos was saying, not just about how we disclose, how we record, but really how do we take the entire uh, spectrum, I think, of decision making? How do we help corporate and uh, investors to manage those impacts? And so I think this is really a tool that was created with the exact sort of intention of uh, supporting uh, the actors as they sort of shift uh, into new uh, business and, and production uh, models. Uh, Lila and others also said it's not just about, of course, climate change. And in fact, as we talk about, you know, net zero and, and moving to net zero, we are obviously talking about, uh, I mean, we need to talk about the social dimensions of, of that change, of that transition. And uh, some uh, uh, highlighted that we still don't know, we still have a lot of information gaps, you know, we were able to agree, or some were able to agree on some of the metrics, you know, some of the pathways uh, for decarbonization. 
But when it comes to the social implications, I think the conversation is very much ongoing. And so I think the main point I want to highlight is that the OECD's expectation from IMP platforms that is going to engage uh, with this topic of the social impacts uh, more specifically. And we hope that together with all the partners, we will be able to bring some new light and new insights into this question. Uh, the social dimensions is not something that so far has been framed in terms of being uh, science uh, sort of based. Nevertheless, of course, it can be made evidence-based and evidence-based means, you know, we have a number of indicators that we can bring uh, to the table, we will, uh, to the IMP platform. But of course, we also have very important international conventions on human rights and liberal rights. And so certainly that constitutes a very starting, I mean, the starting point, I think, for any serious conversations on looking at the S and the social impact uh, dimensions and the social impacts of, of, the, uh, of the, the transition to net uh, zero um, pathways and, and economy. So I think I would certainly think that these are areas that we're going to cover. But as you said, uh, the whole point of uh, getting to agree on those things and getting to agree on what is the approach and you know, what is the trade-off or what is the balance perhaps between man, uh, sort of mandatory and, you know, uh, regulation and and perhaps you know voluntary uh, behaviors. Uh, those are things that are going to be discussed, and precisely this is one of the reasons why it is important that multilaterals such as the OECD uh, and the others that are with us today, you know, are there to convene a forum. And so this is one of the roles of this platform is actually to really be the bridge with policymakers and and regulators. And so we will uh, certainly work to provide evidence-based uh, policy guidance to governments and to the other actors. And we will continue to engage with you know, the member governments uh, of uh, the multilaterals, uh, really being able to bring around the table uh, you know, the, the community that takes uh, decisions on, on uh, these important issues and you know, is able to, you know, to advance on those commitments. But again, commitments that are you know, profoundly sustained and underpinned uh, by, uh, you know, very, very sort of uh, thorough and, and rigorous uh, standards as the one that we're discussing uh, in this uh, organizations. At UECD, and this is perhaps going to be my, my final word, uh, is one of the role we want to play within this platform is obviously bring our expertise on uh, producing uh, high quality statistics and, and data. So we've been working, we're working with many of you on actually strengthening the data production uh, processes uh, uh, that corporates, uh, you know, uh, undertake also the ones of investors, but actually the ones also that national statistics offices are are uh, now collecting on simulations. And the idea is, again, we want to align uh, you know, those production processes uh, in a way that is uh, very coherent. And we are very committed to make sure that this data and methodologies also evolve in line with the societies and the market needs. So we believe that this is going to be, obviously, uh, a, a conversation that is going to be open. So we do have, I think, short-term, very, very clear short-term objectives. So the five years question is a relevant one, but we also are aware about the fact that, you know, one of the interesting outcome of this exciting conversation that we started today is obviously a new set of questions and new set of issues that will come to the table uh, as we take uh, this uh, work forward. So with that, let me thank you again for this fantastic conversation this afternoon, but even more, I think, for the great confidence that you are putting on the OECD and uh, on all the other partners uh, of the IMP platform that we are presenting today. And uh, so thank you again for joining us. And I uh, give back the floor to Eric and Clara. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to all of you um, who, as I said earlier, formed the steering committee for the platform going forwards. And I want to thank everyone who took part in today's session as audience members. As I said, this is a launch event, so it's not the place for dialogue, but the website is absolutely the place for the beginning of dialogue, and that is what everyone wants to have. So very importantly, to receive updates on the platform, you will be emailed a link to leave your details following this webinar, and I hope you'll subscribe by clicking mailing list in the platform's website footer as well. It is a place for engagement and there will be an ongoing dialogue. And I think as you've all heard today, there is much to do. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>